Good morning, everyone. It's still five minutes of morning. Uh, my name is Ellen Vaughn, and I'm with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. I cover our buildings issues and promote sustainable and resilient buildings and building policies. Um, and so it's my honor to uh, introduce our second buildings panel. And as I mentioned in our first buildings panel, the reason that we are talking about buildings is uh, buildings use about 40% of our energy in this country. In yes, is that, yes, sorry, thank you. 40% uh, of our energy consumption, including almost 75% uh, of the electricity, and account for um, about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. So um, not only that, but we use buildings all the time, so we want them to be as good as possible. So um, in this panel, we are um, energy efficient building systems. And really, buildings are, a, is, you know, a building is a system. And so the more that we can think holistically about how they're designed and operated, the better. Um, and uh, so we have technology systems that, that we'll look at. Um, and also thinking about how the building performs. And um, uh, so things like energy efficiency and uh, good indoor air quality that uh, it contributes to good health, um, durability, all these, there are many, many issues, aesthetics, you name it. Um, and so our first panelist, Lauren Asplin, is Director of Healthy Sustainability Programs at the Blue Green Alliance. And um, this issue of um, health in buildings is absolutely critical. For anyone who has been in a sick building, um, it's, uh, it's not fun. Uh, so it's a serious issue, and it has a lot of consequences for the economy, for our healthcare industry. Lauren, thank you so much for, so for being here. And I'll let you um, take it away. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, there's two things going on with the work that I do at the Blue Green Alliance. We have a database of energy efficient products that is based on the Energy Star sectors. And we focus on those that are made in the United States so that it becomes a solution to some of the procurement problems and the, you know, people ask for waivers because they can't find particular products, um, that it's easy to go into the database, which is called buildingclean.org. It is a free database. Um, you can search it through multiple different uh, parameters from whether state to a, a radius, um, so that if you're, for example, looking for lead points, you can get the 100-mile radius um, to different materials, to CSI codes, um, to different health uh, certifications. And it's really on the health certification that I'm going to put most of the emphasis on. We have a lot of uh, materials specifically about various sectors that have potential, potential health problems. Uh, leading that, of course, is insulation and sealants, but we go uh, into others. And um, we talk about what those could be, um, but then also explain that there's, you know, there's ways to get around that and why, uh, you know, you might want to be looking for encouraging your manufacturers to pursue that. Um, the database includes the only location where every product that has some sort of health certification or transparency certification is located in the same place. Um, even today, I had a solo practitioner uh, architect say, thank God, because you know, she, had, she had to go and was searching every single of these databases for each of the certification programs, such as Declare and Cradle to Cradle. Um, and so this, was, this is an easy way to find it. And if it's a transparency certification, you can even click on it, and it'll bring up the list of uh, materials that are in that product. Um, this is a free database. and, and uh, Nobody pays to be in it, so this isn't some sort of self-selection by those who have the most money. Um, this is research that we did. The government no longer uh, maintains these lists. Um, in no way will I say it's comprehensive because there's a lot out there. We're always looking for new uh, facilities to put in. 
Um, but we certainly uh, think that at this stage it's comprehensive enough to, to launch. Um, we will sh the one uh, sector that's missing is windows, doors, and skylights, and that will be up uh, shortly. It's just going through review. But other than that, uh, you know, we cover lighting, appliances, uh, insulation, sealants, plumbing, and then we also added water filtration because of filtration systems because of the concern, obviously, about the U.S. Uh, water, which is still the best, I will say, but um, obviously has some problems in some locations. So we wanted to let people know where they could get U.S.-made uh, filtration systems as well as the key uh, chemicals that they need to be concerned about and to ensure that the filtering uh, takes care of those because just because it's a certified uh, filtration system, you have to know exactly what it's certified for because it can be certified and not take care of, for example, lead. Um, there's a lot <laughs> that do not take care of lead. Um, so we see this as a tool that has uh, a lot of audiences. As I mentioned, architects is one, uh, consumers are another, uh, developers and owners of buildings are third. Um, and then we also include manufacturers, uh, particularly for uh, sub-tier manufacturers who are looking for OEMs uh, that they might be able to market to. So um, it, it covers a lot of ground. It has a ton of information in it. Um, but we, we, we block it off so there's like entry portals for each of those groups. So when you go in, you're not overwhelmed by choices that are probably not this, the information that you're looking for. But of course, you can always access the full range of selections uh, in the advanced search. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And our Next panelist, uh, Greg Merritt, is with Cree. Uh, he's Vice President of Marketing and Public Affairs. Cree has been an innovator and a leader in uh, lighting technology. And he will talk about the next frontier of building energy efficiency. Thank you. I guess it's afternoon now. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank the uh, Sustainable Energy Coalition, EESI, as well as the House and Senate um, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucuses for the chance to speak here today. Everybody know who Cree is? Don't know who Cree is? Some? Okay. You're in our database. All right. You're good. <laughs> I like that. And we obviously didn't pay for it, so she's telling the truth. Um, <laughs> so we, we are a U.S.-based developer and manufacturer of, of both LEDs and also LED lighting systems. In addition to uh, advanced power and wireless semiconductors, which would be the subject of another discussion. Um, we're headquartered in North Carolina. We have facilities in Wisconsin, Arkansas, uh, California. Um, and we're actually celebrating our 30th anniversary on the 14th, so we, we've been around a while. Uh, we were founded out of NC State um, back in 1987. Um, and essentially what our reason for being is we've been focusing on innovation, pushing the boundaries of technology to allow people to do more with less. Um, our products include uh, LED components, so the actual LEDs themselves. We sell to lighting companies, uh, LED lighting products, including LED bulbs. Hopefully everybody's got a Cree LED bulb at their house. Um, LED fixtures for rooms like this, outdoor lighting, uh, and also intelligent lighting system. Um, we also uh, sell our power semiconductors into renewable energy, electric vehicles, uh, smart grid applications, um, and uh, wireless communications into satellite communications and defense applications. So that's enough about us. Let's talk a little bit about LED lighting and what's, what's coming down the road. Um, uh, Cree helped start the LED lighting revolution 2006, which seems like a really long time ago now, um, by really developing the first technology that made LED lighting economical. Um, it had been possible for a long time to do this with an LED, but it wasn't really economical. It didn't pay for itself fast enough. Um, since then, Cree, as well as the rest of the lighting industry, you're going to hear from some of our fellow uh, uh, lighting folks later, uh, we've really been focused on using LED technology to replace what we had before, right? So how do you replace fluorescent lighting with LED lighting, make the quality higher, make it use less energy? Um, but really, it was doing the same thing, but doing it for less energy and saving money. Um, what we're focused on now is really the next evolution of LED technology. So let's go beyond just doing the same thing and do something that wasn't possible before. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you look at an LED light fixture, and I have one on the table out there if you'd like to come by and look at it, um, 
you know, what used to be some metal bent around some wires and a glass tube that got hot is now a digital appliance. So it's a device that has processing, it has software, it has memory, it has communications capabilities potentially, as well as embedded sensing technology. So you really have a digital appliance in the ceiling, and in fact, you have a lot of them in the ceiling. You have really one every eight feet in every space where people occupy. Um, so you've heard a lot about the Internet of Things. I would argue there's more of these things in the spaces we live in than there is pretty much anything else. Until they figure out how to connect in carpet to the Internet, we're, we're probably talking lighting is, is one of the most pervasive, pervasive applications. Um, so early applications of, of using this intelligence were to really improve on what we might think of as the decades-old lighting control industry, right? So you're probably all familiar with dimming systems and occupancy systems that turn lights on and off when you come out of, in and out of rooms. Um, <clears throat> you can effectively do that much more simply and much more cost-effectively using an intelligent lighting device than having a completely separate overlay network of wires and processors and, and other things you have to maintain. But the, app, the potential of intelligent lighting goes way beyond just making lighting more efficient. Hey, now you're all thinking, okay, now I was going to talk about it, right? Lighting is lighting, right? But not really. Um, we can actually use the lighting systems to make the building more efficient. Uh, and we actually can use the lighting system to make the people in the building more comfortable and potentially more productive. Um, all of which will help make the businesses or the organizations that occupy the buildings either more profitable or less costly, right? Depending on which side of the equation you're on. So those are some big claims, right? Um, so, so let's 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 think about how we're going to do that. With the appropriate sensors in a light, and in fact, the t sensors tend to be in every light in our systems. We can actually understand a lot about what's happening in the building. We can understand the building's occupancy, not just whether there's somebody in the space, but actually maybe how many people are in the space um, and for how long. We can understand heating and cooling status. We can understand ambient light conditions. And we obviously can understand the energy usage uh, of the lighting system at a very granular level. Uh, and we can make that data available to other systems that are involved in, in the management of the building. Um, so I'll make a, a little statement about big data here, right? If anybody, everybody's heard about big data, right? The great thing about big data, there's a whole lot of data. The really bad thing about big data, there's a whole lot of data, right? <laughs> so somebody has to make use of that, right? They have to collect it all, store it, process it, and figure out what to do about it, right? So what I think is most valuable about any system that collects a lot of data over a lot of time and a lot of spaces is the ability to analyze that data and develop some actionable insights, right? What does it actually tell me I should do, right, in order to make, to make my building more, more efficient? Um, I mentioned occupancy, so let's talk about a couple of examples. Um, if, a, if a building operator or a space planner can understand the occupancy in a building at a very granular level, right, so over time, by room, how often are the spaces in my, in my building being used, right? I can identify underutilized spaces. Right, everybody says, oh, we're out of space. Maybe. Everybody's got that conference room in your building that nobody wants to use, right? Well, I bet if you looked at the occupancy of that room, it would be very low. So if I'm a space planner, I say, well, why don't I make that room do something else? Right? Why don't I put offices in there? Why don't I do something in there that will be more useful, um, make my building more efficient? Um, we can go beyond just looking at space planning and say, you know, if I also understand uh, usage in my building and say, you know, nobody used that conference room today, so I can tell the cleaning staff they don't got to clean it. Um, I can tell my HVAC management system, you know, based on the an analysis of this building, nobody goes in these rooms till about 10 a.m., so why don't we not cool them until about 9.30 a.m., right? Um, you also can override that, but, but you, you can actually start to use this data to make your building much more efficient. Um, that's, that's one example. Um, <clears throat> you can look at energy usage and identify hot spots, right? Certain rooms or locations in the building, they're using more energy than they should, right, they're, than other places. You can start to go understand why that is. Um, it might be, well, because somebody monkeyed with the occupancy settings and it takes forever for the lights to go off, right, or maybe they don't go off. Maybe somebody monkeyed with the dimming, so uh, it should be readjusted. The easiest thing for me to do is say, well, okay, you should go change that. But it's also easy to take a step further and say, well, I'll just change it for you, and I'll tell you later that, that I did, right? That, that room was off, so we fixed it. 
Um, so uh, we can also then think about some other situations around around employee safety and emergency situations, right? If, if I have an emergency, if I have an emergency situation in a building, I can not only call the first responders, but if they get there, I can say, according to this, there's only people in these rooms, right? So you don't have to go to the other ones. Um, that, that kind of information can be very valuable. Um, let's go beyond just making the building more efficient and talk about the people in the building. Everybody here likes the light level and the color of your office, right? You wouldn't change it for anything in the world. Well, you can actually, with these systems, give you the ability to change it, either manually or perhaps more uh, efficiently do it on a schedule based on who's in the space, right? What tasks they're performing. Um, you know, Al, Al goes, he schedules a conference room. I happen to know he likes his lighting at 3,500 Kelvin and an 80% light level so when he shows up <laughs> when he shows up conference rooms at that level right you don't have to worry about it so this is how we start to make people more comfortable and make people in the building more productive right we make make their spaces more tuned for them why is this important um, a typical commercial space uses about three dollars a square foot in energy um, it costs about thirty dollars a square foot to operate the building so if I can make the building 10% more efficient, my energy just got free, right? The people are about $300 a square foot. If I can figure out how to make the people 10% more efficient, the building just got free, right? So it's actually quite large numbers. Um, so in short, you know, we've all heard about smart buildings. Uh, I guess we would argue you can't have a smart building without smart lighting. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. And from high-tech lighting and, and buildings, we're going to now talk even something more high-tech, it seems. Uh, uh, Rich Kaufman is here, and he's, uh, gonna, he's with Harmonics Limited by Jefferson Electric to talk about harmonic suppression technology. Oh, let's see if we can move around. Yeah, this is tight back here. Well, hello. My name is my name is Rich Kaufman, and uh, let me start by first thanking you for taking the time to be here today. Uh, the effective and efficient use of energy is vital to all of us, and that's what we we're going to talk about today. I'm with a company called Harmonics Limited, and we have been in operation doing business for close to 20 years, and we are now a part of Jefferson Electric. Uh, Jefferson Electric is a member of the Pioneer Power Solutions family of companies. So we have lots going on here. And Pioneer Power is a relatively large company. Uh, they are in the areas of manufacture and service for electrical transmission, distribution, and generation equipment. They are a public company, and they're traded on NASDAQ. So that's, that's kind of the, the boilerplate of who we are and where we come from. Harmonics Limited products are focused in one area, and that is on improving the efficiency and the reliability of electrical distribution systems. That's where we're at. You'll find these electrical distribution systems in office buildings, in hospitals, in schools. They are virtually everywhere. And the purpose of that system is simply to take the high voltage that we get from the utility and it's usually 480 volts from what we're talking about here and distributed it to the outlets that you see around the building that you use all the time. This panel's topic is energy efficient building systems and I want to talk about possibilities for energy savings in those systems, in the electrical distribution systems that is not usually considered. But let me start with a bit of history. Back in 2007, the U.S. government set efficiency standards for distribution transformers. Uh, prior to that, there were some industry standards that went back to the 90s that were voluntary. Uh, but again, standards were set in 2007. Transformer efficiency, by the way, is simply the measurement of power in to power out as a percentage. That's exactly what it is, no more, no less. Okay. One wants to design a transformer that is as efficient as possible, uh, that transforms that higher voltage into the 120 that we need. There's always some loss, but that wants to be kept 
at a minimum. And depending upon the size of the transformer, the efficiency standards already range from 97 to about 98.5%. So transformers are indeed quite efficient. In 2016, the DOE, working with the industry again, set new transformer standards that improved on the old ones on an average of 0.5 to 0.7 percent. So they did make some improvement on the old efficiency. What I want to talk to you about today and what we're introducing at this conference is a technology that can, in certain applications, reduce energy consumption of a, distri of a distribution transformer by up to 10 times the improvement that DOE 2016 did. We call the technology a harmonic suppression system. It's installed on the transformer and it can be placed on existing transformers. There's no need to replace a transformer in order to use this or to make extensive changes within the electrical distribution system. It can easily be applied to any existing system. And the question is, okay, big guy, how does it work and what does it do? A little bit of explanation. Many of today's buildings, whether they be old or new, have a proliferation of electronic devices. And by that I mean you've got desktop computers, you've got workstations in there, uh, you've got laptops, telecommunications equipment, monitors, displays, you name it, it's there. Now, I'm sure you can all list, uh, it, the list is long. And that building can be anything. It can be an office complex of any type. It can be a commercial complex. It can be government. It can be a hospital, okay? It can contain a call or a service center of some time. It can be a university dormitory. Lots of electronic devices in university dormitories, I assure you. It can be a gaming or entertainment complex, a casino. It can house an investment bank. It can house any type of a firm. The point is, that the building contains a large amount of electronic devices and these devices operate on DC power, not AC that's in the outlet. So the AC power from the outlets that we have around here must be changed to DC. That change or switch is accomplished by a little electronic device known appropriately as a switch mode power supply. We all have them. Either if you have a laptop, it's there separate, Whatever you have, it's inside the power supply, but what it does is it simply switches the AC from that wall outlet to the DC in there. Okay, all right, so you told us that. Why is this AC to DC relevant to energy consumption and savings? That's the question, and the answer is harmonics. Let me explain. Our little switch mode power supply is very efficient at what it does, okay? And at the same time, however, it has an adverse effect on our electrical distribution system. And what it does is as it converts the AC to DC, it generates something that are called harmonics. Now, harmonics are really great in music, but they're not so good in electrical distribution systems. They do some things that are quite bad. Now, if you're interested, and I know I can see the anticipation on your faces that you want to learn more about harmonics, and I want to rush on to have this guy tell me everything you possibly know about it, I'd be glad to do that. For now, let's just say harmonics take up space in our electrical distribution system, and they do no useful work. What they do is they generate heat, and they waste energy. The harmonics limited technology eliminates, and that's its function, it eliminates most of the harmonic current from that electrical distribution system. In doing so, it restores the phase capacity that was taken up by the harmonics, and most important of all, it can reduce the energy consumption of that system by up to 7%. The technology is patented. Uh, the design and operation is available for everyone to see. In fact, I have papers on it. I'm glad to give you exactly what's in there. This is not some magic box, and this is not a trust me, all right? We're going to tell you exactly what it is and how it operates. It's patented. The energy savings are repeatable. They're there year after year after year as long as you're using those devices. A number of technical papers have been written by independent engineers to prove this. And if you go to our website, there's also a video on there that does a, a comparison of performance with the HHS system 
HSS system in and with it not there so you can see the difference in energy consumption. A couple of things about our unit. It's passive in operation. It's not an active filter. It works in the background 24-7. It doesn't require any kind of a prevent and maintenance program to operate, and it can be added to an existing electrical system or it can be included in the design of a new system. Let me conclude with just a few comments on use, reliability, and return on investment. Depending on the cost of the electrical power and the load on the transformer, the use of harmonics limited technology and the energy savings can pay for itself in less than two years. There are over 13,000 already installed in the United States and there are at such institutions as MIT, Cornell, Yale, the Air Force Academy, Mass General, John Hopkins Hospital, Bank of America, ABC, CBS, ESPN, and Foxwoods and Mohican Suns casinos. <laughs> the reliability is proven for over 15 years. Applying this technology will reduce energy efficiency, and we can do it today. I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have on this, on about the technology. It is an area that very few people focus on, but it's there, and indeed, using the system will reduce the energy consumption on that distribution transformer. That's it. I thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. And um, I imagine there might be questions, but we have to wait till the end. Um, so thank you. And uh, I'd like to now introduce Alex Rexroat, Executive Director of an I don't want to take up too much of his time, so if I just say this name, that's going to that's gonna be enough. The Heat and Frost Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I had to bring my computer because I have so many notes here that it's going to take all day. Um, first of all, I'm Al Rexroth, and I represent uh, the management side of the Heat and Frost Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust. We have a, the labor side, we're all union, union contractors and union labor. And our objective is to promote mechanical insulation throughout the US and Canada. That, that's what we do. Um, and I wanna thank you all for the opportunity and thanks for being here. Because I don't wanna speak to an empty room, obviously this is very nice. Um, mechanical insulation has been around for about 120 years as a union sector. The first recorded union was in, in 1898 in Chicago. And obviously there's been more since then. But these people weren't altruistic putting mechanical insulation on piping to save energy. They were protecting people from being burnt or for controlling the atmosphere around them. That was the reason for it. Now, obviously, we've changed that, and we look more toward the, the greenhouse gas emission reductions and uh, energy consumption reductions. We're not talking about walls and ceilings now. We're talking about piping mechanical services, domestic water, steam, condensate, chilled water, uh, LNG plants, duct work. Um, this building is loaded with mechanical insulation. You never see it. Uh, a couple of things about M what we call it MI, mechanical insulation. Um, it's probably one of the most cost efficient things you can do in a building. Steam, when you insulate a steam line, it pays for itself in six to 10 months. If the, uh, heating hot water at 180 degrees pay for themselves in someplace between 12 and 14 months. Even domestic water at 120 degrees pays for itself in 24 to 30 months. Now, and I can tell you a real quick story about that. There's a hospital we did. They decided not to insulate the piping in the walls of this hospital. Well, it turns out there was about 15,000 feet of half inch and three quarter inch copper pipe, hot piping. They decided they weren't gonna insulate. They got a $75,000 credit to not insulate it. <laughs> Somebody gets this. 
$75,000 credit to non-insulators. So I ran the numbers through the 3E Plus program, which is the North American Insulation Manufacturers. And anybody can download that, by the way, the 3E Plus. It's free. Go to NMI Insulation, and they'll download it for free. That program indicated the cost of that hospital over 20 years was going to be $947,000 for a $75,000 credit. This stuff really works. Now, so you're going to ask yourself, well, if it's so good, why do we have problems getting people to do it? The biggest problem we face in our industry is that when insulation is off a pipe, it still runs. When the piping is off a chilled water system, it still runs. When they under-insulate a chilled water system, it still runs. So we're talking about clean buildings. We're talking about mold growing on the outside of insulation systems because we under-insulated the chilled water piping. We get vapor drive into the product. We get uh, mold water building on it. We get mold, and we have a sick building. So the reason we have this problem is that when it's gone, the system still runs. They can actually eliminate it. The system Now, it costs more money and it creates more greenhouse gas emissions, but it still runs. The Department of Energy estimates that between 10 and 30 percent of all mechanical insulation that should be in place is missing or damaged to the point where it's not functioning. 10 to 30 percent. And that seems like a lot, but I've been in this industry since 1964, and I can tell you those numbers are accurate. Anywhere you go. We could go in this building today, and I'll guarantee you we'll find uninsulated systems, and we're wasting energy. And I'll tell you how much real quick. The average 125,000 barrel refinery. Does anybody have an idea of how much insulated piping there is in a, in a, a facility like that? There's 1.87 million feet of insulated piping in your average 125,000 barrel per day refinery. Now, I don't, everybody's going, oh, my God, that's a lot. It's enormous amount. <laughs> now, if 10% of that, 5% of that's missing, just five, the cost is astronomical. Why don't they fix it? Because the system's running. There's no reason to fix it. It's all okay. The average hospital, 13 miles of insulated pipe in the average hospital. And the reason we know this, the National Insulation Association, of which I'm a past president, went out into the marketplace to our members and got the data on hospitals throughout the U.S. And the average hospital came up with 13 miles of insulated pipe. So if you think that it really doesn't matter, it matters. And it matters a lot to us. To us, not just me as an insulator, but to a society like ours. This is all over the U.S. and Canada, frankly. So what we're asking <clears throat> is that we keep that in mind. Now, a lot of you folks here are movers and shakers. You're, you're learning the game. You're up on Capitol Hill. You're talking to your bosses. You're talking to the people who are going to make policy. We ask that you just keep mechanical insulation on the front burner. We've been doing this for Five Congresses, Chip? Five Congresses. We've been up here marketing, promoting, trying to get people to understand the need for mechanical insulation. That said, we had uh, last Congress, we had uh, H.R. 4165, which was sponsored by Bob Dole of Illinois. Um, and we were working with him to try and get this bill promoted to require mechanical insulation to give tax incentive for doing it. Um, Obviously, Bob Dole got beat, so we're back to the drawing board, and we're, we're trying to find new people to drop that bill. We have Linda Sanchez from California is, is ready to do it. We're looking for some Republican support. If you know some Republicans that are looking to support something like this, please let us know. Um, so we have that. And then one of the other things we've done, there's a, some of you may be familiar with this, is a 179D is a tax incentive for... Uh, energy conservation, well, mechanical insulation is kind of left out of that mix. Three minutes, thank you. I'll be done. Uh, <laughs> I'm good. Um, we, we got um, 
179D, we're trying to get mechanical insulation included in 179D to help pay for those, that, those energy saving issues. Um, and we may get there. We're also talking to Chairman Brady and the Ways, the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee for expensing, complete expensing of mechanical insulation that makes the field, playing field level for us. Right now it's not, but it, we hope that it will be if we can get that accomplished. Um, we have a booth in the, back in the other, in the corner for those of you who are interested in coming by and learning a little bit more about it. And I would ask if you're really interested, we have a, a, a website called the isaveteam.org. Go to the isaveteam.org and you will find virtually everything there is to know about mechanical insulation. And, and you'll, be, you'll be impressed, you really will. And I thank you very much for your time. Al, thank you so much. I'm so glad that people are working on these things. We don't think about all the time, but they're all part of the system, and it makes a huge difference. So thank you. Um, last but not least, Keith Strasberg uh, with Phillips Lighting. Keith, the only reason you didn't get to go in front of Cree is <laughs> Alpha Order. So <laughs> Don, you got you know the Alpha uh, Alphabet was working with you. Anyway, please. Uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Keith Strasberg. That will he will wrap up our buildings I'll, panels. I'll wrap it up for us. That'll be good. Right, there you go. Would I have three minutes left? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so we'll try to get this. So I appreciate uh, the welcome here. Phillips uh, has been involved with this uh, you know this uh, activity for the past couple years. I will tell you straight off the bat, I do not do the Phillips government policy or marketing like my friend Greg does from Cree. I, I handle all the federal government business, so I'm kind of filling in for that. Um, but one of the, the big things that, you know, we have to rely on that helps me and it helps all of us here, Cree, the, all the lighting companies, all the energy type companies, is we have to keep that key legislation going that's not already there uh, to help improve the energy efficiency of buildings. Um, you know, that's, that's very important. Um, I have a background, and this kind of tells you about technology. I have a background that I wasn't in the lighting world for 20, 30 years. I worked for another large company that used to attend some of these events called Schneider Electric, okay? And so I know all about the buildings being smart. I did BAS, we did drives with harmonics, I did all that type of uh, activities. Um, so the smart building has been around for a while, but I got to watch dumb buildings, okay, we were talking about insulation, actually become smart in the BAS world and everything. So you're wondering like, well, why'd you come to a lighting company after all those years? Because lighting, like Greg's saying, is becoming more intelligent. There's smart lighting and things like that. So now the funny thing with, uh, with lighting, and, and, and we we're talking about Cree, you know, Cree was the inventor, you know, at a college in North Carolina, of the LED, they brought all the LED technology to the field. Philips obviously has been around for quite a long time. Um, about, I guess we were from 1891, so what, 130 years or whatever. Uh, we were one of the first lighting manufacturers. Obviously, we were the, one of the first companies, glass manufacturers, that started making the old school bulbs, you know, back in the day. Um, we have like 120,000 worldwide employees. We're based in the Netherlands. We have all the other stuff that I definitely don't cover, which is all the medical equipment, all the consumer equipment with the Sonicare toothbrush, you know, the TVs you see, so everything else. Um, so we are a very large worldwide company, um, you know, 100 countries, you know, we have 124 production facilities for lighting alone and 10 research laboratories. You know, things that happened over the years, you know, we lit up the Eiffel Tower, you know, to the fact now that with LEDs we light up the Empire State Building. Cree and other lighting companies, we all have lighted up plenty of iconic facilities. But the big thing is, it's really changing in lighting and, and smart buildings and stuff, and I'll do like some of my other fellows, I'll ping on to some of the notes, is everything, technology is changing at such a rapid pace, okay? I can control all the lights that I have at home off my phone, okay? Ten years ago, you couldn't do a lot off your phone at all. You can put an app in right now, you can control your whole building 
BAS, lighting control, your security, and everything else. So as technology changes, it always makes things more energy efficient, but what it does is it gives security, comfort, you know, capabilities to control your own environment. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. So lighting is ubiquitous to everything. You walk into a building, it's all over the place. You know, it affects everyone. It Lighting affects you in your workspace. Lighting affects you at your home. Lighting affects you when you go see entertainment in a stadium, you know, wherever you're at. And instead of just flipping on switches, there has to be a lot more controls. Okay, so the controls came into it, the same as you control a building, you know, with your building automation system, and doing anything else that you do at your home. The big thing, though, is getting information from all these control systems. Okay, so. Before lighting started having a sensor and, and stuffed into every lighting fixture, you know, we were talking earlier about with the mechanical insulation, you know, we we're starting to put sensors onto the pipe that they're insulating to get information back for energy usage. We're putting meters on systems. We're getting all this, you know, big data, as they say it, in the functional operation of a building. Now, all of a sudden, you start seeing lighting fixtures that have sensors in them. Now you're starting to go to stuff like Greg was talking about, occupancy, who's in the office building, what's going on. Now you're stuffing all this data into what I was dealing with a few years ago with some of the government agencies, which is called a single pane of glass. You know, you used to go in and here was your BAS system with uh, all your information here. Here was your electrical system looking at all your meters. Here was your lighting control system. You're bringing it all up into what they call a single pane of glass, which is an enterprise software system to take all this data, put it in a dashboard that you can look at and gather information out of it. There was a switch then in all that that happened when you started hearing big data and data analytics. Now, all of a sudden, you didn't have to have somebody take all this information, sit down with a, some of these people don't know what this is, a slide roll, um, or a Texas TI-30 calculator. <laughs> Um, and do all this stuff. Now, you could actually just go into the dashboard. See, somebody knew the TI-30. Yeah, I'm really old. Um, and they would take all this information and give you the analytics. Now you have software programs that will take this and just crunch it, you know. Um, so in a connected lighting, as well as any connected device, you take all that information up and you start dumping it into these analytic, we'll just call them grinders, okay. The information out there is not only for energy, which we all need to find out your energy usage and to control your energy, but like was mentioned, it's occupation. Why do you want to have that room lit up, heated up, when nobody's using that conference room for four days? You know, you can get into the scheduling and everything else. So that's really where, you know, the smart buildings, um, even though the term has been around for a while, the technology keeps changing. So it just gets getting smarter and smarter. I was talking to somebody out there, they were asking me, the guy was from the U.S. Geological Society, and we are talking about wind farms and everything. So he just wanted to know about it as home, you know, lighting at home, what's changed? Well, 10 years ago, if you wanted controlled lighting in your house, you would have to buy a lighting control system that cost a great deal of money, okay? Now, you put systems in, and the, the brand can remain nameless, and you put an app on. I'm controlling all the lights in my house from my phone. You know, my wife doesn't like it, but <laughs> the dogs do. Um, so that's what's happening. The other thing in lighting, uh, before I get tossed with my three minute uh, card over there, uh, and so we can get to some questions. The other thing you're gonna start hearing in the lighting world, which kind of applies to a smart building, is what's called lighting as a service, okay? So what we did, before Cree came along and made this LED bulb and LED technologies that created fixtures and bulbs and lamps that lasted for a lot longer, all the lighting manufacturers, Philips, GE, Sylvania, were making these glass bulbs that you had to change out pretty often, okay? And I can think of some large federal government facilities where I remember over the years would see skid loads of lights going in, okay? That's just what happened. So all the lighting manufacturers, we're all happy, you know. <laughs> Somebody in North Carolina at a college decides they're going to make an LED, and next thing you know, we're like, these lights will last for 10 or 15 years. So you change the whole 
business dynamics of the lighting world, okay? And that's changing now. So now as a lighting manufacturer, system manufacturer, you have to figure out where do you go next. So that is the systems we're talking about. Lighting as a service, most of you are familiar with getting Pandora or Spotify or whatever service you're going to buy. That's what the lighting companies are looking at. Now you buy a subscription contract to gather all this information from these lighting systems and you can do it where you can design it as the service, maintain it, you know, get all the information and do that exact same kind of business mold in the lighting world. That's what's going to be changing big time in the lighting world. Controls has always been there. The data analytics collected from a lot of these lighting fixtures is going to change, but it's there. But you will not have to change your light bulbs out as often. We all know that now. And LEDs, people keep asking, I'm sure Greg gets it, it's like, what's next? What's next? You know? And you know, LEDs went from this to that. It just keeps changing. It will keep changing. But you have to put it in concept. It goes back to my conversation. Remember I said we made that first glass light bulb back in like 1910 or whatever? You know, think of how long that business survived, okay? You know, till just recently. It just kept surviving. The LED world is just about, you know, a couple of years into it at that same beginning. So it's only going to keep changing and keep moving on. So with that, we have a little booth out there. Remember, if you're going, if you're going back to your representative and who you work for as an intern and you're doing everything, the legislation's key, though, for energy efficiency. We have to keep driving that. Um, will it affect smart buildings? It'll still be smart buildings. But we have to keep driving the energy efficiency codes, rules, and things like that in buildings and, and also in the residential and the commercial world. So with that, Thank that's you. it. Thank you, Keith, very much. Thank you for, uh, for wrapping up our panel.